If you have your Bibles, guys, we're going to go to the book of Joshua, chapter number 24, and verses 14 and 15. Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Glory to God. We'll read that first, and then we'll go to the book of James, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. Jo Joshua, chapter 24, and we'll be looking at verses 14 and 15. It is a good day to be alive. Amen? Amen. You know, um, we started this series on Rooted, and we, we've talked about finding your identity. Uh, we talked about last week connecting with God's church. And now this morning, we're going to talk about understanding your purpose. This is critically important, amen, uh, for us to understand our purpose. I submit to you that it is easy for us as fallible human beings to lose focus on what's really important in life. We tend to get distracted very easily. And in this culture and world that we live in now uh, with, with social media and phones and iPads and tablets and whatever else that we have, it's easy for us to get distracted. But God wants us to focus in on our purpose and why he planted us here in this earth. So look at Joshua 24, uh, verse number 14. It says this. Let's read together. So fear the Lord. And serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols of your ancestors' worship when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. Next verse. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors, your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my house, we will do what? That's what Joshua said. Isn't it? Let's go to the book of James, chapter number four. And we'll begin reading at verse number 13. James chapter four, reading at verse number 13. Ready? Let's read. Look here, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. Verse 17, for good measure, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. <laughs> I need us just kind of just that last verse there. I want us to look at somebody close to us, amen, or somebody across the room. And I want us to read that, uh, repeat that together. Everybody say, remember, remember. It, is it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. I'm going home on that one. <laughs> Bless the Lord God Almighty. Guys, listen, as we get into this, this section of our study, uh, as we are uh, introducing this rooted study, and you, many of you all are studying with us, are going along uh, in, in your book, you know, we talked about some things that are very important. And, and today I want you to resonate on the main ideas. The outline should give you some main ideas. We said, uh, the question is, is stated or the statement is made, how we use our time is one of the most valuable investment decisions we can make. I want us to read that together. Ready? Let's read. How we use our time is one of the most valuable investment decisions we can make. Are the things we are investing our time in, are the things we are investing our time in the most important thing? You got to ask that, self, ask that question for yourself personally. Are the things meaningful that we're investing our time in? And lastly, do the things we spend time, money, and energy on give our lives purpose and glorify God? I want us to read that one together out loud on purpose because I want it to resonate. I want to sink in. One of the things I told you before, it is important for us to start reading scripture, but it's also important for us to start reading a, a, a God honoring principle. This is a God honoring principle. This is a God honoring question that every one of us in here need to ask ourselves. Are y'all ready? Can we read together? Because listen, faith coming by. Hearing. 
and hearing by what? Let's read together. It says what? Do the things. No, no, no. Let's back up. Let's make it personal. Everybody say it's personal. Let's read. Do the things I spend time, money, and energy on give my life purpose and glorify God? Those are some questions that all of us need to ask ourselves. All of us need to be resonating and reflecting on our own individual lives because that is critically important. We, on last week, I shared some, uh, uh, the, some seven rhythms that we are going to, to embrace and, and adopt as a part of our DNA as a body of believers here at this church. And, and these rhythms are, are things that, that, that sh- shape our lives. And Jay, if you got it, you can pop them up. Not, I'll just read them for him. We said, in order to have effective discipleship, it involves seven rhythms, how we move, okay? N- number one, we said daily devotion should be a part of our everyday rhythm. We said prayer should be a part of our everyday ri- rhythm. We said repentance should be a part of our everyday move. Uh, we said sacrificial generosity should be a part of it. We say serving the community should be a part of it. And sharing your story should be a part of it. And worship should be a part of our natural rhythms as a born again believer. And we said when we commit to practicing these seven rhythms in community as a church body, like the early church did, then we're going to see growth and transformation in both our personal lives and in the life of our community of faith. So let's, 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 let's get on to this understanding of purpose. Again, uh, in, in Joshua 24th chapter, Joshua said something here that's really, really uh, resonates with me. And, and most of y'all have uh, if you've been in church for any prolonged period of time, you probably heard that, that, that pointed statement that Joshua made that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This story in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, is about choices, decisions, commitments, and priorities. Everybody say choices, decisions, commitments, and priorities. This is a true t- story that was told about this time management expert who was... Uh, given a presentation to this group of business students as they were, and these were some, some bright overachiever students, smart guys uh, and, and, and ladies who were in this business class, this time management expert uh, asked them a question. Well, he, he uh, not asked them a question, but he gave a demonstration. He had this big one gallon mason jar where he took some rocks about the size of his fist and he began to place those rocks inside of that mason jar. And he placed as many of them as he can till the, the, the last rock he put in there was even with the surface of the top of that jar. OK. And he asked those guys the questions. Those ladies a question. He says, is the jar full? And they said, yes. So what he did was after they said yes, he said, really? You know how some of y'all actually they, really? Now, somebody asks you that when you tell them a story uh, or your testimony or whatever. And somebody says, Really? Does that mean they believe you is, or what you're saying is hard to believe? I don't know. But he asked them, he says, really? So what he did was after that, they said it was full. He went and got a bag of gravel and then he poured the gravel into the jar and that gravel seeped down and filled in those spots where uh, the big rocks left a little gap there. All right. Then he asked them again. He says, is the jar full? They start to catch on a little bit. They said, well, no, it's not full. So what he did then, he went and got some sand and brought the sand and poured it down inside of that mason jar. And that sand began to fill in the, the, the areas where the, where the big rocks and the gravel were not taking up space. Then he asked them again. They began to catch on. Is the jar full? And they said, no, it's not full. Then he went and got some water and poured water in that jar. And then that water filled up every available space in that jar. Are y'all listening to me? And then the question was, what is the moral of this story that I just gave y'all? And one of the students raised his hand real quick and said, well, uh, he said, uh, if you fit, uh, if you are uh, careful about fitting everything in your schedule, you'll be able to get everything done once you take the time to fit those things into your schedule. Uh, and we'll pack them into your schedule. He said, no, that's not the purpose of this demonstration I just gave. He says, the lesson that you need to learn from this is if you don't put the big rocks in first, they won't get in. If you don't put the big things first, they tend to not have a place in your life. Are y'all listening to me today? 
Listen, that, that story serves as a reminder to us to focus on real projects because the big rocks won't get into that jar if you put the gravel in first, the sand and the water in there. They won't fit in, right? And many times in our lives, guys, as born again believers, the things that really matter, the things that are of paramount importance to God and to our salvation and his use, our usefulness of the kingdom, many times we neglect those things. And we put all these other things in place and think that we can come and get those other big things whenever we feel like it. But life does not work that way. Because we are busy, because life is hectic, because the pace of life has accelerated, amen, if you don't work on those priorities early, if you don't, if you don't work on those priorities with intense focus, they will likely not be a part of your individual life. So the question is, what are the big rocks of life for you? What are the things that, 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 that move you, that, that, that are your primary things that drive you as a born again believer? What are the real priorities for you? What do you give your time and your effort and your energy to first? Everybody say first. first. Now, God made a statement uh, as he was talking to the children of Israel, and he said, I'm a jealous God. And he says, thou shall have no other God before me. What God was saying is, he says, I've chosen you, I've called you, I've delivered you, you are my people, and I want to have a preeminent or the preeminent place in your life. What does the word preeminent mean? I've told you all this before. Preeminent means having what? First place and first authority. In other words, God says, God says I, I refuse to be second fiddle. Can I put it the way they will put it in the street? God said, I refuse to be the side chick. Hello. God says, I refuse to be the other man. God says, I refuse to be your sugar daddy. I want first place and first authority. Everybody say first place, first authority. You know, so the question is, again, what are you spending your time and effort on? This is precisely what the message in Joshua chapter 24 is all about. Remember how forcefully Joshua said, he says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, but but what was the context surrounding this statement? I told you before, context gives us insight into what God is trying to tell us in his word. If we leave out context, we're going to miss what God is trying to tell us. What was the context surrounding that statement? What prompted Joshua to make this great statement? If you listen closely, you can hear sort of a strong commitment in his voice, in his words, but also you can see here, I, 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 I sense a, 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 a level of exasper, exasperation. I sense a level of frustration that Joshua had with the people of God. Just like as a pastor, man, sometimes yeah, I love all of y'all. Doggone, I love all of y'all. Did y'all hear me? I'm going to say it once more and again. I love every last one of you all here. But sometimes y'all can be so frustrating. Can I come to this side of here? Lest you think I'm talking about you. Sometimes the body of Christ, sometimes people who are part of the church can be frustrated because sometimes you know to do good and do it and not. And it don't bother you. Sometimes you can be frustrated, but you know what? I, I, I can love you through the frustration because I know I, God, God, one of the, the blessings that I've, I've, I've experienced as a pastor is to see where someone was five years ago and to see where they are now. To see where they were almost a heretic, amen, 10 years ago, and now they're serving God with gladness today. To, the ability to say, I see where you are now, but I know I'm going to be patient with you because God ain't through with you yet. Just like he's not through with me, he's still refining me. He's still perfecting me. He's still making me to be what he desires for me to be. But the reality is, when you lead people, I mean any kind of people. How many of y'all supervise people at work? Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. And sometimes you probably think, this extra money they paying me ain't worth it. Sometimes you want to go to work, do your job, and go home and don't think about nothing. Any supervisor in the house? 
Come on, I know you. I know you like the extra pay for fooling with people, but dealing with people, oh, Lord Jesus, can be so frustrating. So here we see in the tenor of this text where you can feel Joshua's a uh, 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 frustration with the children of God. So, 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 brother Pastor, why, why, why is he so frustrated with them? Amen. Because I think they had forgotten their purpose. They, 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 they become detached from their purpose and why God chose them. And, and, and they were the nation uh, that, that God chose to bring the Savior into the earth ram through. But they were a, a, a very peculiar people and they would oftentimes frustrate even God. Now, if God gets frustrated with you, what do you think about me? The, the, listen, God would get frustrated with me. There were times when Moses, who's the friend of God, had to talk God out of doing something to him. Oh, y'all listen to me. There were times when God got frustrated. So, so back, Pastor, what's the scenario? You see, after all those years of wandering in the wilderness, after God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt and they had one in the wilderness, uh, for, for all those years, the Hebrews had now come into the promised land. Everybody say promised land. The land that they had dreamed of. Amen. The, 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 this situation that they find themselves in right now, they had longed for it. They had prayed for this. But now that they were in the land, they had a big problem. What was the problem, Pastor? Well, other people lived in the land also. Amen? And these other people had their own set of gods that they worshipped. Come on in a little closer to them. They had a god of war. They had a god of wine. Some of y'all want to serve that god, don't you? A god of wine. They had a god of fertility. Amen. Sexual orgies were a part of the worship experience. The line was very long at that church. Amen. They had a God of this. They had a God of that and a God of the other. Amen. And some of these false gods apparently were attractive to the Hebrews. In fact, some of these false gods were so enticing to the Hebrews, to the Israelites, that they actually began worshiping them instead of worshiping the Lord. And this, of course, amen, was a blatant violation of God's first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God be what? before me. When Joshua saw what the Hebrew people were doing, hear me carefully, when he saw what they were doing, he boldly spoke out here in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 15 here, uh, when he says, you know, choose this day who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, guys, when it comes to God, our choices are yes or no. Let me say it again. When it comes to God, our choices are yes or no. We can't sit on the fence. We can't skirt the issue. We have to decide either yes, God, I'm going to follow you, or no, I'm not. There's no such thing as straddling the fence. Lukewarm, God's wanted to spit you out of his mouth. Amen. Do we accept God in our lives or not? Do we commit our lives to God or not? Do we put God first or not? Again, this story in Joshua 24 is about choices. It's about decisions. It's about commitments. And it's about priorities. Let's bring this a little closer home right now. What are your priorities? What are the big rocks in your life? Uh, well, 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 if, if you don't put those in first, you'll never get them in at all. The big things, the priorities, amen. Let me suggest three priorities for you. And this is part of y'all. Three priorities that we as believers would all do well to embrace as we live our lives here on this earth. Because if we look at this, uh, this, this text here and we look at it, we're going to go to the book of James a little bit later on. But we're talking about understanding our purpose. Again, God was going to use the nation of Israel, he was going to use the, the, the Hebrew people to bring the Savior into the earth realm. Remember when he, when he called Abraham, Abram, and he says, listen, uh, get, get out of your country, get away from your family members. I'm going to take you to a place that I'm going to show you where I'm going to take you to, and I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Through you, everyone on this, ble- on this earth will be blessed because of the seed that's going to come forth from you. And the seed that they were talking about was Jesus Christ, who was born in the manger in Bethlehem. Are y'all with me today? So, so three priorities here that when we look at this, uh, three priorities for us as believers. First, there should be a commitment to Christ. Everybody say commitment to Christ. Say commitment to Christ. Now I got to ask you a question now. 
Do we really understand what it means to commit to something? Do we? <laughs> I, was, I was reading this, uh, and I, don't, I think it was a true story, where the uh, pastor was marrying this couple, and he went to that part about uh, uh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and in sickness and in health. And she was giving that to the bride at the time. The bride said, I will take better, richer, and health. <laughs> That's not a, the marriage vows are not multiple choice. You don't get to choose just, I'm, I'm, as long as you uh, uh, have plenty of money, I'm with you. But as soon as you lose your occupation, as soon as, as, soon as our bank account goes low, I got a jet. I'm with you as long as you're healthy, but as soon as you become sick in your body, I, can't, I, I just can't handle it. I, 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 I got to move on. Uh, so, you know, we, we have to learn how to commit. What, what, so what does it mean to commit to something? That means to give yourself wholeheartedly to that thing that you say you're committed to. Amen. And you can tell when somebody's committed to something. How many of y'all can tell when somebody's committed to you? Let me, let, let me ask you a question. Can, can, can we get real? I like to use everyday analysis. I like to use real life issues because sometimes in the church we don't like to talk about real life issues. We want to talk about way up in these, these high platitudes, but I want to get down to where we're living. All right? How many of y'all have ever been dating somebody and through the course of your dating you discovered that you were not their priority? Uh, uh, come on, come on, come on, not your head, not your head. They were your priority but you discovered soon after start watching this thing a little bit, you, you, you start noticing that, that, that uh, uh, certain times of the day they can't answer their phone. Hello. And you call and they only call you at night. Or when, 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 when their phone pings, they got a text message coming in and you look over there they hide and stuff. <laughs> Can I bring it close to home? Or when you say, let me see your phone, what's your passcode? I ain't giving you my passcode. Oh, so, okay, let, let's go. Let me, let me modify my example. You married and your wife asks you for your passcode. Are you married and your husband asks you for your, the passcode of your phone? Now the two are one flesh, all right? Y'all are one flesh, y'all together one, but now you're saying, that's my own private business. Let me tell you right now, I told you before, there's a dead cat on the line. <laughs> I don't care who you are, there's something wrong with you if what you have is not open to your spouse. <laughs> are y'all with me? See, sometimes when we're with people, they're not with us like the way we're with them. And sometimes we treat God that very same way. We treat him as an afterthought. We treat him as somebody who we can go to when we need something. And God says, I'm a jealous God. And I'm not going to have any other gods before me. It's either yes or no. Some of y'all dating somebody right now, you need to tell them, okay, now it's time to, it's time to do what or get off the pot. You older folks know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> it's time to fish or cut bait. Because what we've been doing, how, how you my fiance for 10 years? <laughs> Tell me what does that look like? Either we're going to do the thing or we're not. And part of the reason why the thing hadn't been done is because you've been giving up the thing that you shouldn't be giving up until the thing is done. <laughs> You'll catch that when you get home, okay? See, if you will be a man, a man letting your body be a living sacrifice and stop having sex outside of marriage with them, you'll find out real quickly how committed they are to you. Okay, can y'all come back in with me? So do we accept God into our lives or not? Do we commit our lives to God or not? Do we put God first or not? Again, first there's a commitment to Christ. Now, there's a, 
There's a, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bobby, William Bobby McClain. He's a, he's a black theologian and civil rights leader who was a part of the Methodist church. And prior to his death, he served as the professor of preaching and worship at Wesley Theological Seminary. And he also served as a pastor in the United Methodist Church. Uh, he, he passed away in, in 2020, but Dr. Dr. McClain once told about meeting a South Korean tailor in Seoul, Korea. And amazingly, this tailor introduced himself as Smitty Lee. And Dr. McClain was fascinated to discover a Korean named Smitty. And he asked whether the name Smitty was a Korean name. The, the Korean tailor said no, and then he told the story of how his life had been saved some years before during the Korean War by a courageous American soldier from Virginia who was called, who was called Smitty Ransom. And the tailor went on to explain a rather familiar custom in that Asian culture, summing it up in two simple sentences. He said, he saved my life, I took his name. He saved my life, I took his name. This is exactly what happens when Jesus comes into our heart. He saved our lives and we take his name. We take on the name of Christian, one who is of Christ, one who follows Christ, one who belongs to Christ, one who serves Christ. But sometimes we get busy and distracted and we lose our focus and forget our name. Now let me ask you a question. Since you've been born again, have there been times where you didn't act like a Christian? Have there been times when your attitude was not God honoring? Have there been times when words came out of your mouth that were not magnifying God, words that came out of your mouth that actually brought embarrassment to the name of Christ, the name that you carry, the name that, that's on your chest saying, I am a Christian, I am a member of the Elizabeth Baptist Church in Benton, Louisiana, the place that's a bridge to, to, to bring others together in the body of Christ. Have you ever embarrassed yourself and your church? Have you ever embarrassed the Christ who saved you? Sadly, I think all of us, including myself, can say I have. But what are we doing? What are we focusing on? on? What, what, what are we doing? Sometimes we get busy and distracted and we lose our focus and forget our name. We get so involved with the gravel and the sand and the small petty rocks of life and, and, and sadly we drift away from the rock of ages. Jesus Christ, if we don't put the big rocks in first, we ain't gonna get them in at all. If you don't put your prayer time in first, it's, have y'all ever discovered this? If you don't study and pray early in the morning, sometimes the day get away from you. Think about this for a second. Think about the life of Jesus. The Bible oftentimes says Jesus rose up early in the morning to get before his father and pray. I think there was something to that early. Everybody say early. early. Everybody say early. early. <laughs> some, some of you know that, that, that old traditional church. And, but it, so, so early, Jesus rose up before day and got before his father, before the distractions of the day, before the vicissitudes of life began to press in on him. Then he got to God so that he could be prepared for the day. And I think that's a healthy example for us. Some of y'all say, I'm not a morning person, Pastor. I stay up late. I stayed up late last night at 1.30 watching Colorado beat Colorado State. If you stay up late to watch the game, how can you stay up late studying the Bible? <laughs> Let's come in a little closer here. Let me see the hands of y'all who stood up and stayed up and watched the game. Let me see your hands. Come on. Now, if I ask you to stay up and, and pray, <laughs> What's important to you? Do y'all, some of y'all snore? My wife tells me I snore. I don't know that I do. <laughs> but three parties for the believer. First, there has to be a commitment to Christ, and you can tell whether or not you're truly committed. One of the first things, now again, this, this, is, this is, as I told you, our life as believers goes beyond just coming to church on Sunday, but, but coming to church on Sunday is a part of our life as a believer. 
Hebrews, the 10th chapter, I believe it's around verse 23, 24, 25, one of those. It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but come together even more as you see the day approaching. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but come together even more as you see the day. What day is the day of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to his church? And you see that day approaching. As you look at the signs of the time, you begin to understand that we're living in the last days. We ought to be gathering even more so. But the gathering is there to equip us, to train us to go out. But one of the first signs of commitment for, to, to Christ is that you do be a part of your church's uh, authentic community. That you do, that, that you do uh, uh, put yourself in a position where, where God can, can develop you and, and God can, can pour into you and God can connect you with other believers who can help you grow in your faith. Because all of us have gift things that each one of us, the other people need. You have a spiritual gift that we need. But when you don't show up, you can't be used. I said, when you don't show up, you cannot be utilized in the things of God. If you're not willing to be discipled, how, pray, tell me, are you going to be equipped to disciple someone else? Jesus pulled those boys in close to him. And he began to talk with them, eat with them, share life experiences with them, minister with them, train them, talk about what, what worked and what didn't work. We got we to gotta get to that point, guys, where Jesus Christ is first. Second, there is the commitment to family. Everybody say commitment to family. Whatever shape or size our family may be, we got to decide and we can decide to work at it. We can decide to give our best to it. We can decide to make our family a priority. Now, we just recently um, buried my mother-in-law, Mama Kirk, Margaret Kirk, and most of y'all know her. Um, and one of the things that, that was very, very, very dear and important to her was to make sure that her family stayed together. Because I, I, would, I would challenge you to go back and read her obituary. It's one of the, the most, one of the, the most, enlightening and beautiful obituaries that, that's ever been written, in my opinion. Now, I'm not saying it because of my mother-in-law, but it told her story. It told the things that she went through as a child, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, verbal abuse, all those things, and being from house to house, and finally having a place where she could call home. I was reading, uh, 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 you know, I was listening to a lady giving a testimony about her life and how she went from foster home to foster home and how that impacted her life. And, and when she finally got to a, a home where somebody loved her for who she was unconditionally, how much an impact that made in her life. But Mama Kirk would always tell her kids, she said, listen, y'all may fall out, but y'all stay together. She would constantly tell them, hey, y'all stay together because family was Was important. <laughs> Thank you. Dear. Man, I learned a lot from that lady about family, about embracing our families. Yes, all of us got some crazy folk in our family. All of us got some people in our family that, that, that we probably would rather not spend as much time with. But everybody say they're family. And you, you and I as born again believers, how can we have impact on them when we never even attach ourselves to them? How can we influence them if every time they come we run? Uh -huh. Don't you realize that your part, really your purpose for being here, your purpose as a born-again believer is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your purpose for being saved is not just to get to heaven. Your God wants to use you to reach people, but you cannot reach people when you run from people. So, I won't get to it today, but we're going to talk about that when you have a relationally intentional environment, you make space and room for difficult people. 
Can I say it again? We won't get to today because my time is running and I'm going to finish on time today. But, but when you have a relationally, a relationship, intense, intentionally relationship environment, then you make space for difficult people. Can I ask you a question? If I saw you 20 years ago, would I like you? If I were to look at your life when you were in your thing, doing your thing and your attitude, would I have, would I, would I have wanted to be around you? I'm, I'm looking at the cleaned up version of you now. The non-cussing version of you now. The non-homonging version of you now. The non-racist the non, uh, 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 version of you now. Because the grace of God is powerful enough to redeem anybody. That's the redemption story. Quit giving up on people and, and trust in the power of, God, of the gospel to redeem mankind. We sit around and we start talking about people. <laughs> Rather than saying, God, Put me in front of that difficult person at work that nobody wants to be around. Give me an opportunity to have a conversation with him. Give me an opportunity, God, for us to be alone, if it's in the break room, if it's at lunch or whatever, and just, just let me go and just love on that person. Because usually people who are like that, there is something deep inside of them that they hadn't dealt with. Some of y'all are mean and some of y'all are ornery and a little bit hateful because you hadn't dealt with some of the things from your childhood and hadn't got released from it. And it's still it's still captivating you now. Yeah, you say, but you hadn't dealt with the trauma of your childhood. Family of origin issues. Remember we talked about that. So until you start dealing with that and understand why you are the way you are and, and allow God into that space to deliver you then you won't, you, won't, you won't want to deal with certain people in your family. But, I, but I, again, I appreciate that about my mother-in-law. She was always uh, want to know who's coming home for Thanksgiving, who's coming home for Christmas, uh, who's coming home for my birthday. You know, from her 80th birthday on till she died, pretty much, I think, except for this, maybe this past year, all her kids made a commitment to come home on her birthday. Um, and, but because family was important, and family should be important to you also, to the point to where you'll decide to do family life God's way. You know, too many of us have been injured, and, and again, listen, listen, learning how to forgive is a part of the process of being committed to family. Are y'all with me? We, we got to give our best to cultivating a healthy family relationship because, listen, it is, I, don't care what you, I don't care what anybody says. It is very difficult to be uh, serving in ministry and doing what God told you to do when you go home and you got World War III. My wife is not with, with me today. She's out of town. But one of the things that we made a, a covenant commitment to do, and then we have our times when we have heated fellowship, Richard. Richard, I know you in the sometimes have heated fellowship. Any mayor, Elijah, do you and LaWanda have heated fellowship sometimes? But y'all still together? Brenda and Donnell, do y'all have heated fellowship sometimes? But y'all been married probably over 40 something years, haven't you? See, because you deal with difficulty, when you commit it to the relationship, you don't tuck tail and run. Commitment to Christ commitment to family, and then there's commitment to God's church. Everybody say God's church. church. Now, we said God's church because it's not ours, it's his. So if he's the one who created the institution of the church and chose to use the church, amen, to to, as his vehicle here in the earth realm, the institution in the earth realm he utilizes to reach lost man, then, then, then we should, if God is committed to his church, then we got to be committed to his church. So much so that when I find out what his word says about his church, I don't fight it, I embrace it. To the point to where even when he says something that, 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 that sometimes my feelings and my flesh is not ready to accept, I decide that I'm going to be obedient to his word until my flesh and my feelings catch up to it. 
Remember I told you that before? Be obedient and let your feelings catch up. Because I would much rather, amen, be right with God, come on, amen, in intimate relationship with him than to be out of fellowship with him doing my own thing. So, so, commitment to Christ, commitment to family, and commitment to the church. Um, there was this, <laughs> this, I was reading about this minister who had, uh, who recently wrote a letter to a family in this church. The family had been, been very active in the church at one time, but they had, he hadn't seen them lately. And he was concerned, so he wrote to them to say that he was missing them and hoped that they, would, that they were not unhappy with him or with the church. And a few days later, he received a very haunting letter that went something like this. Dear Pastor, thank you for your kind letter. And yes, we haven't been in church for several months now. So maybe we should explain. In the summer, we go to the lake every weekend. Our kids are young now, and it's so important that they learn how to water ski and become expert skiers. And we like to get away too, Jack and me, because there's so much going on in our lives, and we just need a break. But then when summer's over, soccer begins, and our kids play all play in the most competitive leagues. They have games every weekend, and sometimes the games are out of town, and when they're, out, when they're in town, we go to the soccer games either on Saturday or Sunday, and there's just no way we can make it to church. We'll be back in church. Don't give up on us. There's a brief period of time when soccer is over and basketball hadn't yet begun, and it's too cold to go to the lake, and that's a great time for us to go to church. But then again, it's Christmas, and you know how hectic that is. And after Christmas, we just have to go to Colorado to ski, so that's t that time's got to, be a, got to be a problem, too. But one of these days, don't be surprised when you look up and see us out there in the congregation, because we just love you, and we just love our church. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but you get the drift, right? I don't want to be surprised when I see you in church. Don't surprise me. I want you to be familiar and committed and common. I want to be able to look right there on row number three and see Jerry and Beverly Blake. I want to be able to look right there on row number two and see Yvonne Barley. I want to look at row, row number one and see Tony White. I, don't surprise me. <laughs> commitment. Everybody say commitment. commitment. Part of that means evaluating our time investment. Go to James chapter four, start at verse number 13. James chapter four. Verse number 13. I'm going to give you these, and I'm, I'm getting, I got two minutes, okay? As a matter of fact, guys, I don't even want to start here because I can't finish this. Can I finish it next week with you? Yes, All right, but, but three things I don't want you to miss here. We said, as believers, we need to be committed first to whom? Christ. Christ. Second, what? Family. And third, what? God's to God's church. And understand and embrace what commitment means. Jesus understood what commitment meant because he was sent on mission by his father. Jesus came for purpose. He came to die a sacrificial death so that you and I could have a right to the tree of life. He came to give his life so that you and I could connect with the God who created the heavens and earth. God's plan all along from the time that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden was to bring the sacrifice from heaven to be born in a manger in Bethlehem, to die a sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary, be buried in a borrowed tomb, raised again the third day morning with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. And if we will accept that sacrifice, Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we can have relationship with the triune God. And I thank God for that awesome sacrifice. Jesus gave his life for you and I. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. And we praise you for this privilege. Thank you right now, God, for loving us in spite of us. Joshua said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, he said, we're going to serve the Lord. And God, I pray right now that as we stand here before your people, that God, each one of us, 
would make that same declaration that Joshua made when he said, when we will say to ourselves that we're going to serve the Lord, me and my house will serve the Lord, we'll be committed to God's church in such a way and fashion that, that our very life revolves around the directives that you're giving us as a born again believer, the directives you're giving us as a church family, God, that, that we put the big things in first and don't try to squeeze them in to our busy life schedule. Lord, we all come to you right now saying, forgive us, God, for there were times when we did not make you a priority. We didn't tell those things to move over. We allowed them to crowd in and take a preeminent place in our life, a place that's only reserved for you. Thank you, God. And I praise you. Hallelujah. Now, if you're here in this place today, if head bowed, if I close, if you're listening via live stream, and you cannot recall a time where you truly, honestly made a commitment to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you were to die right now, are you confident? Do you really believe and know with all your heart, mind, and soul that you, that you would spend eternity in heaven and not in hell? If you don't know, today is the day to get that blessed assurance. If you're here today and you're not sure, if you're listening via live stream and you're not sure of your salvation, I want to give you this opportunity right now to ask Christ to come into your heart to save you. He made it very simple, but it was complicated. It did take an awesome sacrifice. It took him giving his life, being crucified on Golgotha's hill, the place of skull, so that you and I could have the privilege to enter into the presence of a holy God. If you just say, I realize I need to be lost, I need to be saved, I'm lost and need to be saved. I believe Jesus in your sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. I believe you did that for me so that I could have a connection with the God who created the heavens and earth. And I want you to come into my heart to save me. I yield my will to yours right now in Jesus' name. And I promise you, God knows your heart. He knows if you're serious about it because your seriousness of it will show up in your corresponding action. If you, may, if you said those words a long time ago but had not followed up with action corresponding to your confession of faith, then your confession of faith may not have been real. So if you want to be saved, just ask him, say, Jesus is coming in my heart to save me. And he'll take you from there, get connected with a Bible-believing church, and grow and be disciples. But maybe you hear and you say, Pastor, listen, I know I'm saved, but what you said resonated with me this morning. I have not been a very good manager of my time. I have not made the main things the main things in my life. I've allowed other stuff to squeeze out the things of God in my life. And I need you to pray for me this morning. If that's you, lift your hands right quick. Come on, lift your hands. Because I, I, God is saying, I'm calling this church, I'm calling you as individuals to be more committed to my purpose for your life. We'll unpack some more of it next week. But your purpose is to be transformed, to be, re you, are, you have been redeemed, but God wants to transform each one of us so he can use us to advance kingdom principle. If that's you, you say, Pastor, man, you know, I, I've not been a good manager of my time. I haven't spent my time in prayer and studied God's word like I need to. And I want to I do life differently. If that's you, raise it. Come on, lift your hands. Come on. Be honest, guys. Listen, be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hand because there's some times when I'm not as diligent with my time. I waste more time than I should. So I'm, ready, I'm, I'm praying for me too. Let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come in for your presence. Thank you for this day. Thank you that you've given us the privilege and the honor to be here in this place today. You are an awesome God. We love you, we praise you, and we lift you up. God, we magnify you. You are certainly worthy to be praising God. We come before you right now saying, forgive us, God, for being time wasters. Forgive us, God, for not putting you at the forefront of our day every day, at the forefront of our week, our month, our year, God. Lord, we say we're sorry. So we ask you right now to forgive us, God, for not making you a priority, for not 
spending time in your word like we need to, and spending time in prayer, and spending time serving and sharing our story. Regulate our minds, God. Fine tune our focus. And help us to dial into you like never before. Spirit of the living God, have your way in our life. For we love you now and we praise you. And we thank you right now, God, that, that, you, that you forgive us. We thank you right now, God, because you said if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness and we receive your forgiveness right now. Oh God, we love you and we praise you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. All God's children said amen. Come on, say amen. Say amen again. God bless you. I thank God for each one of you all today. And I want you to know, hear me carefully. Every last one of you in here are important to God. Did you hear me? Every last one of you in here are important to God. And every last one of you in here, God wants to use you to advance kingdom agenda. Kingdom agenda is God's way of doing things. And it'll be evident in our life when we have the visible demonstration of the comprehensive rule of God in every area of our life. In our finances, how we treat our family, how we work, how we serve in ministry. When, when the kingdom agenda has its rightful place, it'll be evident in how we do all those things. Love you guys. And let's keep tapping into understanding our purpose. Next week, we'll finish the rest of this outline. But I want you to know, God is saying it's time for us to get busy. It's time for us to put ourselves in a position where God can use us because we want, we want to become disciple believers who consistently walk in the ways of God and have kingdom impacts in our homes, schools, jobs, and the community at large. We want to reflect our faith and lead others into a personal relationship with the Savior Jesus Christ. I share with you part of our part of our mission is, is for us to get involved in the community. We we are we we connect with different organizations, different ministry organizations. Uh, we have an opportunity to serve this coming week uh, with our common ground ministry. We also have an opportunity to serve this week my G-Men Brigade. That's our, our G-Men cooking team will be serving the Woodlawn High School football team. It's coming Friday at 3 o'clock. If you want to cook, you don't have to be able to cook, just come and pass a plate. I don't cook, but I'm going to pass a plate. Amen. Because we want to show the love of Christ to uh, a broad cross-section of, of, of people. We have 318 Church that's coming up on the first Saturday in October. Uh, at 5 o'clock, we're going to go out there and serve uh, the marginalized, those who live on the streets. Uh, 318, we partnered with them to do that. Uh, and so we're going to be going to feed them this, this Saturday. You can plug in there. The, if you need a place to plug in to, show, to take yourself, the image of God, into the community, it's time out for us stand inside the four walls of the church. Take God to work with you tomorrow. He's, our, he's in you, you know that, right? Take him to work with you. What, what do you mean by that, my pastor? The way you behave, the way you work should demonstrate that you belong to God. Don't go up in there looking all mean, fussing, cussing. But go in there and be a light in that place. Amen? I love y'all. God bless you all. Won't you stand to your feet? If you have a prayer request, as you stand, prayer warriors will be at the altar. If you want to, be, if, if God has let you be a part of this fellowship, if you need a individual prayer need, our prayer warriors will be at the altar to pray for you. If you made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ during that, uh, that appeal, then come up. We want to celebrate with you. Amen? God bless you. We love you. And we thank God for each one of you. Don't forget Monday morning connect. We pray every Monday morning at 6 a.m. God bless you. Join us for our prayer time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you now for this privilege you've given us. Thank you, God, right now for being a part of this worship experience. God, help us to make the main things the main thing. And God, let us not put, try to grab hold to the main things after we've done everything else because we won't be able to fit 
the main things in our life. I pray for every believer here is in this place. Pray that you would just watch over us, guide us, lead us, and protect us. God, help us to be what you called and ordained for us to be. God, help us to attach to and embrace our purpose and to understand why you saved us, why you left us here. You want to use us as ambassadors for Christ. Now, as we leave this place, God, guide us to our destination. For we love you now and praise you. Now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, may it rest rule in the Bible each of us now and forevermore. Shall we all say amen together? God bless you. Hug somebody. We love you. Have a great week.